The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, a classic if there ever was one. After a wildly groundbreaking first game and a decent though somewhat odd follow-up, the Zelda series had come to its crossroads with the launch of the Super Nintendo. Would it merely seek to improve on its predecessor's legacy, or would it strive to make its own path? The answer, it seemed, was a mixture of both, perfecting the first game's established formula while introducing series standards such as parallel worlds, multi-tiered dungeons, and of course, the Master Sword. Now, the gameplay? Incredibly polished. The sense of adventure? Unmatched! And the amount of secrets to uncover numbered in the hundreds. But for all its praise, there is one facet of Link to the Past that is often overlooked, and that is its emotional core. So, the game opens with a few ominous messages from Zelda and your uncle before throwing you straight into your adventure. None of those constant tutorials the Skyward Sword delighted in. All you need to know is that the princess is in the castle and she needs saving. The tone is immediately set by the music and rainfall, but reinforced by the way the game subtly pushes you towards the castle. None of these guards can be attacked or passed and just refer to you as kid. It makes you feel weak, small. There's no way directly into the castle, and you eventually find yourself slinking in through a hidden passage under a bush. Not the most glamorous of entrances. And even after you've gotten your sword, that's all you have to defend yourself with. Meanwhile, the palace is swarming with guards of every color, the easiest of which still require two hits to kill. Hell, getting the boomerang halfway through doesn't even help your chances much, considering it merely stuns the enemies. The result of this design is that, although the game is not based around stealth, the player at least has a feeling of dread and a desire to be extra careful while making their way to Zelda's cell. It's interesting to note that the way the castle's basement is designed is deliberately made to be winding and off to the side. It reinforces that feeling of sneaking through enemy territory. Soon enough, you'll have rescued the princess and escaped from the castle, first by sneaking above the soldiers and then through the dark and desolate sewers. You may be weak, but you sure are resourceful. Then comes the now traditional Zelda structure. Leaving the princess with the kindly old man in the sanctuary, the player now finds themselves tasked with collecting three pendants to awaken the sleeping Master Sword. Over the course of this quest, Link gains a bow and arrow, bombs, and perhaps most impressively, the dashing abilities of the Pegasus Shoes. These allow the player to cross the massive overworld with ease. An overworld, I should add, that mainly contains two major enemies, the green soldiers who, as I mentioned, take two sword hits to defeat, and the blue ones who can take three before succumbing to their pixelated wounds. That doesn't sound like much, but after dashing into groups of soldiers time and time again, the exact amount of hits to defeat each soldier will be ingrained into the player's mind. So, with that subconsciously learned, and with all three bosses defeated, it comes time to retrieve the Master Sword. For the second time in the game, the weather is used to set the mood, an eerie fog covering the entirety of the Lost Woods as you make your way to the sword's pedestal. And then, just when the player is feeling elated, finally having their prize, it all falls apart. A telepathic message from Sasha Rasha Ding Dong suddenly informs the player that the Sanctuary is under attack. It's the first time the game is broken from calmly suggesting where you go, and while you still technically can wander around leisurely and continue with side quests, the change in tone emphasizes that the player better hurry up and get to the sanctuary. Alas, no matter how quickly you reach your location, you'll always find the same result. Zelda is gone, the old man gravely wounded just barely able to tell you that Zelda has been taken to the castle before perishing from his injuries and suddenly, the game's plot and emotions fall into place. For the first time, you're not running because of convenience. You're running to avenge the old man who gave you your first heart container and to finally assault the castle which before seemed impossibly foreboding. The days of sneaking around are over. This time, with the strength of the Master Sword, most of the enemies you've grown accustomed to die after a single blow. And after piercing the wizard's magical barrier, you find yourself in combat with the knights that before you couldn't even attempt to overcome. This return to Hyrule Castle is a masterpiece in manipulating the player's emotions through gameplay, showing them how far they have come since their journey began, and yet, whenever the sudden transportation to the Dark World is revealed, showing just how far you have left to go. The enemies in this new world are more grotesque, have crazier ways to attack, and can take even more damage from the Master Sword. But with that boost in confidence gained from defeating the wizard once, the player is certain that when the time comes, they'll be able to finish the job once and for all. 
So, in the end, does Link to the Past get enough recognition for the way it portrays its story and thus gains the player's attachment? Well, console Zelda titles that followed tended to be more cinematic and thus more direct in their depictions of the legend, and that's a trend that likely won't be slowed down anytime soon. But even with all our high-tech consoles and the promise of more complex storylines in the future, it's important to remember where we began, where the tale of a boy's journey to save the world could be told with only 16-bit sprites, chiptune music, and a whole lot of heart and great game design. My name's Josh C. Joshua, and that is really freaking clever. If you liked this episode, why not subscribe and share this video around? Help a poor Canadian student out. And if you want some more of my crazy antics, check out Friendly Fire, home of extraordinary Let's Plays and other random nonsense. P.S. Making this video go viral would be really freaking clever.